we would like to catch the mecha, the the booster in the giant mechazilla arms, which is sounds kind of insane. Um, and uh, because this is the, the this is the largest flying object ever made. Well, this incredibly insane feat is going to be one of the most impressive aspects of SpaceX's Starship performance in Flight Five, and it's ready to happen this Sunday. So, how will the Starship Flight Five launch unfold? What's going to happen with Mechazilla's first attempt to catch the booster? So, before we get into the main content, we want to extend a quick prayer to our friends in Florida who have just faced one of two of the world's largest record-breaking hurricanes in as many weeks. May Mother Nature be kind to us all so Florida can quickly recover from all that damage and get back to their normal everyday lives. Thank you. Now, back to the main topic of today's video. With just a few days left till SpaceX's seemingly dreamlike flight takes place, this is the perfect time for us to check out the detailed timeline corresponding to each stage of the massive spacecraft's launch, especially what's going to happen during the Mechazilla catch. The latest closure notice from County Judge Eddie Trevino Jr. reads that entrance to Boca Chica and State Highway 4 are going to get closed for flight activity and SpaceX flight testing activities on October 13th. These closures are yet another pre-flight development indicating that a launch is imminent, and they signal that SpaceX is confident that the FAA will give them the launch license for the Sunday launch on time, fingers crossed. The Starship Flight 5 commences at 7 a.m. and wraps up at 12 a.m. While the actual duration may vary, the time frame gives ample flexibility for SpaceX and the other systems involved. During this period, a bunch of different processes will unfold, categorized into two distinct phases. You got pre-flight and then in-flight. Let's start by talking about the pre-flight procedures. Approximately an hour and 15 minutes before liftoff, SpaceX's flight director will confirm the commencement of propellant loading. This critical step is expected to last somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. Then, 49 minutes prior to liftoff, the crucial process of loading liquid oxygen and liquid methane onto the stages commences. Although these timelines differ a little bit from Flight 4, the changes are insignificant as they only amount to a few seconds. Prioritizing the booster for fuel loading is strategic given its large size compared to the actual ship. This sequence ensures that both stages are filled concurrently, minimizing fuel wastage due to wait times. Moreover, beginning with a booster enhances mass distribution and stability, preventing the upper stage's substantial 1,300-ton mass from putting excessive pressure on the lower stage. Refueling process is going to happen quickly. Although SpaceX is still doing upgrades to the tank farm, based on the recent wet dress rehearsal test, we can assert that the fueling process will not significantly be affected by this issue. It might even be faster. Throughout the fuel loading process, an important step involves cooling the Raptor engines in both stages. This precautionary measure serves to minimize temperature differentials between the engines and fuel, mitigating the risk of sudden cold fuel that could potentially damage sensitive engine components like the injectors and manifolds. Between 3 minutes and 20 seconds and 2 minutes and 50 seconds prior to liftoff, fuel loading on both the booster and ship will complete. With the final 30 seconds, the SpaceX flight director conducts a final verification prior to launch. Upon readiness, the flame deflector gets activated just 10 seconds prior to liftoff. Then, at 3 seconds before launch, the engines ignite, marking the exhilarating moment we've all been anticipating, liftoff. Similar to flights 3 and 4, the transition from engine activation to departure from the launch pad is going to be brief, only about 3 to 5 seconds. This process minimizes the impact of thrust on the pad, a lesson SpaceX learned from earlier launches when the pad suffered damage. At liftoff, all 33 engines spring to life at the same time. Building on the lessons we learned from the IFT-1 flight, which encountered some engine issues, the later flights demonstrated the impressive coordination of all 33 engines, working harmoniously after liftoff, creating unmatched thrust. Therefore, for Flight 5, there's no reason why SpaceX shouldn't be able to repeat the same thing. Prior to engine ignition, the water deluge system activates, spraying, get this, approximately 350,000 gallons of water to mitigate the intense heat and pressure produced by all 33 engines. Recently, we've also seen SpaceX test this system in quick succession twice, actually, demonstrating that it is fully capable of completing the mission successfully. After departing from the launch pad, Starship and Super Heavy embark on a southeastern trajectory towards the Gulf of Mexico. At around T plus 102, both stages will encounter the Max-Q moment, where vehicles experience the highest mechanical stress. 
Given Starship's successful navigation through Max-Q in previous flights, we're pretty optimistic about its performance here. Following Max-Q, the pivotal stage separation happens. Initiated at around T plus 2 minutes and 33 seconds, the booster engines will gradually be cut off, a process known as booster MECO, that's main engine cutoff. The outer and middle engines then deactivate, leaving only three inner gimbal engines to sustain thrust for the booster. Two seconds after that, Starship's engines activate, facilitating separation. During this transition, the hot staging mechanism introduced in Flight 2 continues to play a role, dissipating heat and pressure to safeguard both the ship and the booster. Timeline adjustments for Flight 5 have been accelerated by about 8 seconds compared to Flight 4. From this point on, subsequent timelines may be differing by a few seconds. After parting ways, the two stages embark on their separate trajectories. The booster undergoes engine relight at around T plus 2 minutes and 48 seconds. We will then see 13 center engines ignite to quickly reduce the booster's velocity in just a minute. At T plus 3 minutes and 43 seconds, they'll decide to perform a hot stage separation with Super Heavy, aiming to reduce some of the rocket's weight, increasing its chances of a successful return. This technique was likely a useful trick learned during Flight 4, which is why they're continuing it for Flight 5. By T plus 6 minutes and 8 seconds, the booster enters the transonic phase. At this point, the timeline in Flight 5 will have shifted by 30 seconds compared to Flight 4. 20 seconds later, the three center engines of Super Heavy ignite and fire for about 20 more seconds, helping the booster align for landing. Here, SpaceX's timeline splits into two possible outcomes for Super Heavy Booster 12. The first scenario happens if B-12 operates unstably, like engine malfunction or a slight misalignment. If this happens and SpaceX thinks it's unsafe, they'll immediately execute a soft water landing like they did for Flight 4. In the second, more favorable scenario, SpaceX will confidently proceed with the goal of catching Super Heavy using the chopstick arms at T plus 6 minutes and 56 seconds. This will be the first time the Mechazella has ever attempted such a bold maneuver. No other organization or agency worldwide has ever tried something like this. The adjustable Mechazilla arms, comparable in size to an autonomous drone ship, play a pivotal role in SpaceX's booster recovery. These arms can be precisely positioned to catch the booster. The recovery focuses solely on the first stage, eliminating the need for heat shield modifications. Recent tests done by SpaceX, such as using the chopstick arms to lift the booster off the top of the launch tower, using a 500-ton simulated load to test the arms, and several slap tests with a B-14 test tank, have all demonstrated the flexibility of the catch system and its control software. While the catch is bold and a little bit risky, as I analyzed in my previous video, SpaceX's extensive experience with over 200 successful Falcon 9 landings has significantly refined the recovery process. Although unforeseen issues can arise, this impressive track record suggests a reliability rate of approximately 99.5%. This level of consistency boosts confidence in both the SpaceX team and Elon's vision for reusables. Once booster recovery is routine, SpaceX will only need to replace six Raptor engines on the upper stage for every launch, significantly reducing the complexity and cost compared to manufacturing an entirely new rocket. As a result, SpaceX could potentially increase its launch frequency fivefold, drastically improving our access to space. Looking down the road, upper stage recovery could be achieved soon after Flight 5. Once SpaceX demonstrates the ability to get both stages without damage, it will mark a pivotal moment in space history. Of course, we can't forget the path of Starship's second stage either, Ship 30. Ship 30, upon separation from the booster, initiates its own engines, comprising three sea-level engines and three vacuums, to continue its journey into orbit. This process takes about six minutes. About eight seconds post-launch, the Starship engine ceases operation. Starship will then fly a quarter of the Earth in the next 40 minutes. During this time, SpaceX may conduct some minor experiments with Starship as they did in previous launches. In those two previous ones, SpaceX performed payload door opening and propellant transfers. However, one test that SpaceX skipped over in Flight 3 and 4 is the in-space engine restart, and that's also likely going to get skipped here. Up until about T plus 48 minutes and 3 seconds, Starship will execute a belly flop to re-enter the atmosphere, aided by the heat shield. By T plus 1 hour, 2 minutes and 34 seconds, Starship will transition into a transonic and subsonic state. Guided by landing engines, Starship will approach the surface of the ocean, splash down in the Indian Ocean at approximately T plus 1 hour, 5 minutes and 34 seconds. Exciting stuff awaits this next flight. With many upgrades and preparations made, 
We're predicting that they'll successfully carry out all these procedures, marking an important milestone for the Starship and herald a new era of development for SpaceX and Starship. This achievement will serve as the foundation for humanity's efforts to send people and cargo into orbit with a reusable, paving the way for lunar exploration, Mars colonization, and beyond. Only a few days left, dear friends. Get ready to join us on the enchanting journey known as Starship Flight 4. And that's it for today's episode. Thanks for watching and see you next time.